Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So we are going to start uh, the session uh, with uh, Professor Ikuma Adachi. Uh, he is uh, assistant professor uh, at the Primate Research Institute uh, of, uh, in Inuyama in Japan, at Kyoto University. And uh, after he obtained a PhD uh, from the University of Kyoto, he did a postdoctoral work at the Yerkes Primate Center. And today, uh, Professor Adachi is going to talk about social recognition in non-human primates. First of all, I want to thank all organizers for a kind invitation here. I pretty much enjoy it. This is my first visit to India. I really love this country, and the food is just great. So I'm really happy to be here to um, share my, in, uh, my interest and work with you, and I hope you enjoy it. And today, I want to talk about social recognition in non-human primates. So instead of having just um, more like a study on consciousness, so I want to talk about cognitive systems and I want to show this some continuum from non-human animals to the um, human beings. So when we process um, stimulus in the environment, we usually have an input from the environment or sometimes inside of your body, and then you have to respond back to all the in, uh, stimulus. So that's kind of input-output relation there. The underlying or behind those input-output relationship, we always have the cognitive systems working on it. First, we have to perceive the stimulus through the sensory organ. So for the visual information, we have to get information through the eyes, and then which go into the brain, and then you can process those information into the perceptor, and you can handle those in the uh, higher cognition later on. So the interaction between this perception and the cognition is really important to give some feedback or the respond back to the um, original stimulus. So this cognitive system is kind of I'm really focusing on, okay? And uh, especially I'm working in non-human primates, which is called the comparative cognitive science. What we do here is uh, working on the empirical study of the cognitive systems in the various species. Because human, co uh, human cognitive systems are also product of the evolution. So it's kind of continuum from non-human primate to the human. And as much as body and also social structures. So the mind itself or the cognitive skills itself, we cannot see directly, but that also the uh, product of evolution. And that's why it is really important to study whether and to what extent we share the cognitive systems with other species, especially non-human primate, to answer the question how we acquired our cognitive skills. So this is what I'm working on. And why do we need experiment? Because only from the observation, it's really tough for us. It's hard we know that underlying cognitive systems. And of course we can see whether or not we can do it or whether or not they can do it. Yes, no type question we can answer to some extent by the observation. But if you want to answer the question of how we actually do it, then ex experiment is really important. So here I want to show you some quick um, experiment. So we all know we can discriminate faces. When you meet friends, when you meet family members, you don't have any problem to discriminate those faces. You remember the faces, you can discriminate faces, but how you actually do it? Do you know the answer of it? All right, here is some short um, example. So I showed you the four pictures of the female face. Do you see any difference among them, or do you think just the same pictures? Same. How about this now? It's the same pictures. But hopefully, most of you find some difference among them. So picture B, for example, have a relatively narrower distance between nose and mouth, and C has relatively wider distance between eyes. So the configuration among the eyes, nose, mouth is manipulated among those pictures. And we have strong sensitivity toward this manipulation in upright orientation, but actually not, happen for, not applicable for the inverted faces. So this short experiment already tells us how we actually perceive the faces. We focusing on the configuring information in the faces, but that only happened on the upright orientation, not in the inverted orientation. So this kind of experiment is really important to see what is the underlying mechanism, how we actually do it, okay? So here is another one. Now I think you see the difference between those two pictures. Relatively easy. Here on the right, eyes and mouth are rotated 180 degrees related to the other parts of the faces. And we can detect this even in the inverted orientation, but much less than we do in upright orientation. Now it's a really strong effect. It's even grotesque, people say, right? So both of those effects is kind of basically reflect that human process configuring information among the eyes, nose, mouth, more in upright faces than the inverted faces. 
Now, through those kind of simple experiments, we can see it. Okay? And especially among the cognitive systems, I'm interested in the social cognition because here's one really influential uh, hypothesis brought by the Humphrey in uh, 1976, which said the sophisticated learning and cognitive abilities of animals basically have been selected for the, by virtue of their usefulness in the social domain. Because social stimuli is really important for the social living animals, and also the, those are really dynamic in the information. They're always changing the location, in the shape, and also relation among the individuals. So track those dynamic information is really important and that kind of require a lot of the cognitive abilities. That's kind of original idea. So that's why we're focusing on the social cognition more or less. I mean, I'm also interested in other, but also here I want to talk about social cognition. And among the social cognition, I uh, especially uh, focusing on social recognition, which, is meaning, uh, which means recognizing other individuals. Because this is the most fundamental aspect of the social cognition Unless you really discriminate other, indivi other individuals in the group members, you don't really can, you really cannot modulate your behavior based on the, who you are faced on. So it's really important to track other group members, and for that, recognizing other in individuals is pretty much important. And from the field studies, um, we know they can do it. They can discriminate uh, other group members from the visual information or from the auditory information. So we know that can, they can't do it. But again, the question remaining, like how do they recognize others? And how do they store those into their memory as a representation? So this is kind of really important question we want to answer by the experiment. So today I want to talk about two uh, topics related to this social recognition. First one is how do non-human primates perceive other individuals, especially we focus on the face perception, and also how they develop their face perception uh, during, the, uh, during their life. And second topic is, do they have like, accessible memory representation, integrating multiple information? And uh, we try to answer this by uh, assessing cross-modal access to the visual representation of familiar individuals, which basically integrate in auditory information and visual information. And from one of them, they need to uh, recall the integrated information or representation that I want to show uh, you today. All right, so let's move on to the first topic. It's face perception in non-human primates. And the face perception, before going to the non-human primates one, we want to just, I want to just summarize what we already know about human uh, face perception. So as we already experienced through the quick experiment, we have strong sensitivity toward the confusing information among the face, especially the eyes, nose, mouth. <laughs> and which is only happening for the, or more happening in the upright orientation than the inverted orientation, which causes better discrimination in upright faces compared to the inverted faces. So given that, for example, just imagine that the situation you face with your friend and share the one magazine, and one of your friends just pointing one face and, hey, look at this guy, and then you look at the picture from the opposite side, then you sometimes have a hard time to understand who was it. So this kind of things happen. So better discrimination in upright orientation, but not in inverted orientation. Okay? And in the development, we already know that the configure processing comes first, which means no matter what face we saw, we see, we just focusing on this configure information. This comes first. And then later on, around six to nine months, we start to tune up our system. So faces that we see during the daily life, we can keep the discriminative skill. But the faces we don't see during the environment, we cannot do it anymore. So after nine months, we kind of lose the discriminatory skill for those kind of faces. Okay? That's kind of how we develop um, our facial uh, recognition. Yeah, so that's what's called like a uh, perception narrowing, by the way. And for the face perception, non human primates are also kind of extensively studied, but mostly focusing on the inversion effect, which is basically showing the poor performance for the inverted faces. And even those are kind of not fully conclusive in the macaque species. So chimps kind of showing more or less um, uh, regularly showing the inversion effect, but the other species not so much. And also more importantly, most of the tests with non-human primate have not manipulated the computer properties directly, which means even though we can show the poor performance for the inverted face discrimination, we cannot really tell it's, from, it's caused by the lack 
of the computer processing and inverted phases. It can be another reason. So we don't know this kind of shown inversion effect in non-human primates is also connected to the computer processing or not. And that's why we focus on such illusions, which has directly manipulated uh, computer information in the phases, and thus which allows us to their, uh, test their configure processing more directly. Just for the reminder, and in case you want to see this grotesque face more again, I want to show you. So here, eyes, mouth, rotate, and we have strong sensitivity toward this kind of manipulation in upright orientation. So we tested the same thing with the monkeys. So we prepare the frontal face of the picture. Um, the, it's a little bit hard to see, but just a normal face, and also such a version of it. So now eyes, uh, eyes and mouth are kind of rotated, related to the other parts. It's relatively hard for human because we already tune up our face, uh, face perceptual system to the, our own species. So we kind of lose this uh, skill to the apply computer processing for the monkey faces. But here is a one such wise one. And we test it in the two conditions which uses only upright pictures or inverted pictures. And here you can see more uh, detailed how it goes. So in the habituation phase, uh, we use the habituation dishabituation paradigm which is often used in developmental psychosis. And in the habituation phase, what happens is just they are exposed to the same picture again and again and again. So here, no more picture, no manipulated picture is shown and repeatedly shown again and again. And what we can expect is they just got bored to see the picture. They are exposed to the same picture again, so they just don't have any interest anymore in the last, in the end. So they just lose interest and they don't see the picture anymore. And after that, we show two pictures, or oh, one by one. And sometimes they are exposed to the same picture again, or such a version of it. So what we can hypothesize from this procedure is if they uh, detect the manipulation here, then they should treat uh, this is a new picture, so they kind of recover their interest and then look at the picture more, but when they expose the same picture again, then they don't see it. So that would happen for the upright orientation if they have a similar possibility system than we have. But if they don't have this uh, sensitivity, then they will not differentiate their behavior toward those two pictures, and they could be different and upright and inverted. Okay? Now we can see the result. So y-axis indicates how long they look at the picture. And the left half is from the habituation phase, the average of the first three presentation, average of the last three presentation. And the right two is from the test phase. So when they see the same picture again, or they, when they see the saturated version of it again. And graph will be colored in red and blue. Red is for the upright condition. So when they see the upright pictures, and inverted condition is in blue. Uh, which is they are exposed to the inverted phases. So what we, what, uh, we can find, what we found for the habituation phases, they actually get bored. So in the beginning, they look at almost seven seconds or even more, but in the end, they just look at the picture around two seconds, so they got bored and they lose the interest. And what happened in the test phase, in the upright condition, we can see the big jump, which means when they see the saturated version of the phase, then they recover their interest and look at the picture again. But when they see the same picture again, it's stay on the same level or even lower. And which happened in upright condition, but not happen for the inverted condition. It's slightly uh, increased, but there is no statistical difference there. And so this study um, showed that monkey also have the configural processing for the faces, and which only for the upright orientation, but not in the inverted orientation. It's pretty much the same for the human does. And we had a nice uh, follow-up study done by Christoph Dahl, uh, actually sitting over there. But the, what he does is such a, examining such a resolution in the monkey and human. And he used both stimulus types, like human faces and monkey faces. And what he found is human only showed such a resolution for the human faces, but monkey only showed the monkey faces. So there is some species-specific behavior there. And for human case, we know we tune up our visual system to the, our conspecies through the development. So that's why um, that could be explained. But for the monkeys, we are not sure. So some of those studies, monkey process configure relations more in upright than in inverted faces, same as humans do. And their face perception is tuned for the processing of their own species. So which means monkeys show the such illusion only toward the monkey faces. 
Okay? And we don't know the underlying or the what can be the cause. It could be because they may have program templates. From the beginning, they may have the template for the research macaque faces. Or could be passive generating that human as human do. Be, uh, so through the first year of life in the development, they may be tune up their system toward their own species. And long-term expertise would be just lifelong exposure to the own species may tune up their system more. So we don't know which was the cause for, uh, for this case. So we extended more uh, study more in detail. In this case, we focusing on the early development of their face perception. So we tested uh, baby uh, macaques. And we used the same procedure, habituation, dishabituation procedure. And this time we used the monkey faces and the human faces to see if, like, uh, whether they show the, such illusion to the both species or their own species or none of them. Here we see the result, but this time the, uh, the graph is plotted a little bit different way. We plotted this habituation index, which is calculated by the their looking time towards such a rise phase, so manipulated phase divided by their looking time toward the same phase in a test phase. So if its score is one, which means either phase is present, they just look at the same level. But if its go over one, which means they look at the such a rise phase more, so that means they do the dishabituation or they recover their interest toward the manipulated phase, okay? And left two is from the monkey faces, so we're gonna start to look at those two. So what we can see here is in the upright condition, again, their score is over one. So they dishabituate, they recover the interest toward the saturated faces in the upright orientation, but not in the case for the inverted faces. So it stay at once, it's almost the same level. They don't discriminate those two faces, basically. So there's a significant difference here. And what happened for the human face is actually more interesting. They do show they have a sensitivity toward configure processing or the configure manipulation in the human faces as well. So here is a little bit weak, but it's still um, significant tendency there. So seemingly the baby macaques also experience such illusion also in the human faces. So they develop computer face processing first, same as humans do. So they apply this computer processing toward the non-conspecific faces as well. So this is kind of similar to the human does. And probably what ha happened afterward would be they tune up their face system toward the uh, faces that they are exposed to during the environment in, a, uh, in, in, in the environment later. So that should be a perception narrowing. So we are not confirmed this part yet, but most likely this happened because in the beginning they show this configure processing for the both type of the faces, but later on, like a Christoph's uh, experiment, uh, they only show the saturated illusion toward their own species, which means they already have tuned up their system toward the conspecifics. So this passive narrowing would probably happen later on. Okay? And we also interested in the how actually long-term expertise can interact with their early development in the phase perception as well because passive channeling is a really strong, uh, strong phenomenon. So after this tune-up, so second year, third year, they cannot really learn the new type of faces. It takes more time to tune up or re-modify their face template toward the other species or other races. But after the long, long exposure to the another type of the faces, they may be able to tune up again or refine their system again toward those other species or the other races. So we tested two group of chimpanzee. So one of them is three full adult chimpanzee around 30 years old, and three juvenile chimpanzee 10 years old. So those individuals are kept in captivity, and they are grown up in a group, which means in the beginning they are more intensive connection to the, their own species. But later on, given that they have just given a limited number of the conspecifics, they have more and more people they are meet to, or they are face on which means they, have, they are more exposure toward human later life. But in the beginning, they have more extensive exposure toward the own species. So we want to see, is there any difference the, on the visual perception of the faces between those two age groups? <coughs> and for the method, it's really simple, grade much into sample task, which already Rob Hampton talked about. And for the stimuli, we use the chimpanzee faces and the human faces. Here, you can be a subject now. Just try to remember this, and which one is the same one? You have to answer the same individual. You have to pick the same individual picture. Anyone? 
right and left? Wait. Yeah, it's right. This is correct. So yeah, um, we human can do it to some extent, but we want to see how precisely you can do it to the other species and to your own species. So we want to compare these kind of things among those two age uh, difference group, different group. Here I show you the result. So the blue color is their performance toward the chimpanzee face, and here is for the human. And you can see Rift 3 show the higher performance in blue. Blue is higher than red, blue is higher than red, but these three is showing the opposite, right? So, and when we overlap another information onto it, actually the young individuals onto the left and old individuals on the right, which means young individuals showing the better performance in the chimpanzee face discrimination, while the older ones showing better performance on the human face discrimination. So it's already switched, okay? And we, on, uh, we add one more question, which is actually bias in the chimpanzee and also the impact of the expertise onto it. Because from the human literature, we already know right hemisphere is highly employed for the face recognition, especially if it's from face area, it's really important for that. And which is connected to the behavior level to the following way. So right hemisphere is connected to the left visual field, which means when you look at the face, left visual field will be more important or more informative for you to processing the face. So when you make a, just when you cut the face in half and then flip this side to the other side or flip this side to the other side, you can create a face with only left half information or right half information. <laughs> okay, this is called such, uh, the chimeric face. And we can't test them, like which information they more rely on. So showing the original face first and then showing two faces which left left information, right right information, and which is more closer to you. So by asking this, you can see which information is more informative for you for the processing of the faces. So um, again, we use a direct matching to sample task. Um, and here, just unmanipulated face presented. And then is a left left chimeric face or right right chimeric face presented, OK? So both of them is kind of chimeric face. So just basically cut half, and then this probably from the left left, and then this from the right right. Now you can see, so just remember this face, which is, looks closer to you. Left, right? It's the same person. So just uh, use this on the chimeric face. Left? Hmm, interesting. It's actually the wrong <laughs> direction. <laughs> For me, at least, maybe this race effect there, but the, this one is kind of left, left chimeric face, and this is the right, right chimeric face. So if you cut half, this one is kind of original left part. This one is the original right part. Okay? And how about this chimp's face? No clue, probably, right? Right? Right is correct, actually. Wow. It's impressive. And now we can see the chimp performance. It's more, kind of more or less interesting, I think. So here I plotted like a, how much they are left bias. So if it goes down, it's basically just calculate or subtract their performance to pick the left uh, from the right. So which means if it goes to the negative, which means they have more, sense to, more uh, frequency to choose a left-left chimic face, okay? And up, upper panel is from the chimpanzee stimulus, and for the bottom, it's human stimulus is presented. And what we can see here is all of them showing the left-left bias, left bias. So they use the left half information more uh, than the right information, right visual field information. So which can show that they also have like a laterality bias in the brain to some extent. We are not directly focusing on the brain, but it's kind of one uh, behavioral exp uh, evidence that they may employ the right hemisphere more than the left. <coughs> and more interestingly, what we see here is actually the more uh, the younger one showing the more strong left bias to the chimpanzee face, and the old ones show less, but it's opposite for the human faces. So it's kind of strongly correlated their performance as well. So young one who is better in the perform, uh, discriminating chimp faces, showing stronger bias in uh, chimp faces in the left to the left, but old one who is good at uh, discriminating human faces, showing more left bias toward the human faces. 
So it's nicely correlated. So the more they can discriminate, the more they toward the left bias. All right. And for more detailed information, we have the poster. Uh, so just come to our poster, which is presented by Christoph Dahl sitting over there, and just find this guy. Oh, no, no, this guy. This one is such a version of him. So just find him, not him. So um, he will be happy to introduce more detailed information about this experiment. OK, so now we, I want to move to the second topic, which is cross-model representation in non-human primates. And which, um, as I told you, I want to focus on the auditory visual cross-model information or cross-model representation. And we use two subjects. And as a task, we use a delayed matching to sample. But this time, we use a video as a sample and picture as a choice. And so after watching those type of videos, they have to match uh, the picture to, uh, based on the identity. Now you can see a uh, trial, how it goes as well. So first green dot, which is basically a self-start key. So after they touch it, the trial initiate. And now you can see the videos. So remember that in the video. Which one is it? Don't worry, you are not monkey. You are not good at this many monkey faces. Top right? Well, bottom left, yeah, bottom left is correct one. So we have some monkey experts seemingly here. But so this is a kind of basic task. They have to match visual to visual, video to picture. But after they learn this task, we um, introduce uh, auditory information, which sometimes match to the uh, video of this one which means just uh, same individual voice, or sometime from the another voice, uh, another voice from the another individuals, okay? So the hypothesis we have is really simple. If monkey have the cross-model representation of family of monkeys, then vocalization should activate the representation of the monkey. If that happen, then the activated representation may produce facilitation in uh, when they hear the match voice, or the interference when they hear the another monkey's voice, with their uh, correct visual matching performance. And especially facilitation would be indicated if monkey improved their performance in the congruent trials. So, and also the interference would be more indicated when either of uh, monkey are less accurate in incongruent trials and or monkey made errors in incongruent trials by choosing the vocalizing monkey. I think it's clear. And here is the result. Um, Y-axis indicates proportion quite how much they can pick the uh, correct monkeys, so, and now we see the control condition, which doesn't have any voice in it, but have the same length of delay. So it's basically just looking at the memory decay according to the uh, longer delay period. And monkey one showing like 65 percent, monkey two like around 50, a little bit less than 50 percent. And what happened when they hear the same individual's voice from the video? Then they actually got some improvement here, and when they hear the another monkey's voice then they got some decrement here. And uh, actually, there is some significant difference between those two conditions and con control is just right inter uh, intermediate. But that is not the case for the monkey, too. I don't know why this happened, but I mean, this is a uh, case. And we also did error analysis more in detail, and uh, more detailed analysis, which is in congruent trials, what they pick uh, for when they make an error. So that's kind of question. So when they make an error, if they make an error based on this vocalization, then they should pick the vocalizing monkey more. So that's kind of things we plotted here. So proportion of choices of the vocalizing monkey is now plotted here. And we have four wrong choices. So that's why the chance level is around 25% on the 25% here. And they actually, both of the monkeys picked more uh, vocalizing monkey when they made the errors in the income trials. That's what you see here. So uh, to sum up those, uh, when they made errors in the incoming trials, both subjects selected the vocalizing monkey more often than expected by chance. So both of them got interference. And one of two object, uh, subjects showed a better performance in the congruent trials than the incoming trials. So the monkey also showed a facilitation and the interference, both effect. And either way, at least both of them showed the interference from the auditory information in a systematic way, which proves that our monkey have the cross-model representation of familiar conspecifics. And it's really important to note that we did not train them 
to associate all the three information to the visual information which used in this experiment, which means our task is kind of touched on their natural behavior or natural representation which they formed before, even before the experiment. All right, um, I guess that's it. Thank you for your attention. In the in the chimeric phases mm -hmm. experiment, you have left left and then right right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but but uh, how do you decide which is? There's no correct response there, right? You just look at right. So it's a randomly right? reinforced. So we okay. don't. Yeah. So there is no correct or wrong answer. We just calculate how many times so, they pick the left left phase okay. or how many times right right phase. But but it seems to me, looking at the data, that there seem to be developing a response bias rather than some sort of laterality. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe you have control experiments you haven't shown us. Um, so in other words, initially there's really no bias at all to speak of. Oh, yeah, I mean, this is a timeline, so it's kind of right. a trial. So it's fast trial right. here. Right. So as trial goes, of course, we calculate the number of the left left choice. Right. But, but, could, right choice. but could it be because of the random reinforcement that they just develop some arbitrary bias? And it, Well, I mean, that, as far as we randomly reinforce, of course, it's not so much possible for the systematic way, I think. So um, what we hear is just, you know, uh, in the beginning, of course, it's one or zero or one or plus, uh, plus one or minus one. But if they pick more and more to the left, then it's gradually go to the down. So here, for example, one minus 100, one minus 100 at the time of the 300 trials, which means among the 300 trials, they pick 200 times for the left left chemic and 100 for the right right chemic. So it's just an accumulation of the, the choice toward the left width by uh, left width uh, chemic phase. And we, since we randomly reinforced their behavior, uh, I guess there's no way to systematically um, acquire this kind of bias. Right. My name is uh, Sh Sharath Chandra. I'm a research associate at the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences. Before I actually go to my questions, a quick observation about that face flipping thing which we all picked wrong. I think the initial stimuli had partial occlusion because it wasn't illuminated uniformly. So I guess that that was like <clears throat> the att attentional bias. But before this, uh, so my question is like for, for my computer vision algorithms, I use uh, modified versions of the of a HAR cascades classifier for facial recognition. So mm -hmm. a computer can rec recognize say a face in a magazine but of course cannot recognize um, me drawing two dots on my thumb and a smiley, which looks like a face. But um, And often when I'm dri driving on the highway as well, if, if you look at a truck with headlights, it has that conceptual representation of a face. Mm -hmm. So what, what I want to know is, do you think there is a difference between organic facial processing and conceptual facial processing? Is it related to like ventral and dorsal streams? And if you have done any experiments on how non-human primates really still make that construct of a face when it's hmm. a kind of abstract representation of spatial configuration? Well, I think there is no clear experiment for that. But I mean, at least we have like a schematic face experiment, so which is basically line drawing of the face. And they treat it as a just face. At the same time, um, for the car or any other like a face-like shape, which has contained some um, configuration similar to the faces, and which is called the first order um, relationship, means two dots on the top and one dot on the bottom, which are kind of good enough to make us feel its face. But it's really initial phase of the processing of the face, and later on we have more like a tune-up and precise. Um, um, processing of the face stimuli, which is kind of second order relationship, it's like a configuration among the feature. So this is a little bit different. So for first, like a two dots on the top and the bottom, might be the little bit more conceptual, abstract uh, kind of feeling for the uh, face, but this is more like a precise uh, processing for the face discrimination. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering whether there's been any work, at least in humans, mm -hmm. on which elements of the face uh, tend to code for recognition. 
the reason I'm saying that is because at least I think Vauclair's work on baboons showed mm -hmm. that the eyes were more, perhaps most important. When they changed all the other features in the face, the eyes seemed to be the one that gave the clue that it was still the same face, mm -hmm. even though all the other features had changed. Right, right. In humans, since there's so much of differences, racial differences across humans. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, I find it definitely easier to distinguish between two Indian faces mm -hmm. than between two Japanese faces. Right. And that could be because Indians might focus on the eyes, mm -hmm. which are perhaps the most variable feature of their faces, whereas for the Japanese, the eyes may not be as variable across individuals as are other features of the face. Mm -hmm. So, has there been any such studies in primates, uh, including humans? Um, yes, uh, to some extent, yes. Um, it's not directly compare like where they look at or where they use as a cue, but where they look at the face can kind of different across the culture, for example. Like a Caucasian people is more focusing on the eyes. And when you look at the faces, they just stay on the eyes, for example. And then, of course, just staying one point, they can get the whole confused information, but they stay on the eyes still. But for the Asian people, especially Japanese and Chinese people, Stay on the nose, and it's partly because maybe we think that like a staring, staring at the eyes is kind of more rude in the culture. That could be, it. but at the same time, I mean, tuning toward their own race might be uh, reflect like a which part is more informative as well. So that could be the case, but there is no clear evidence for the more than that. And most of the cases, eyes is more important. It's partly because it can carry more information than the identity. It can also carry the emotion. It can carry like an intentional, uh, intentional direction and so on. So eyes are more informative. That's why they look at eyes. But at the same time, during they look at eyes, they're getting more confusing information as well. I was thinking like, uh, is it some kind of correlated, <laughs> correlated response that you see that say in the face, even just looking at the eyes, mm. you may not distinguish the population of uh, like, and a person who lives in, who was born and brought up in Africa versus uh, Asia. But when you look at the other parts of the face, then you make a much clearer distinction. So essentially, it perhaps not only the one particular location of the face, but rather than you say, kind of a correlated response of other traits of the face being assembled and processed. So in that situation, so do you think that the old if, if this holds a plausible hypothesis, then like the from the old to the young, there is a switch that you were showing, like from the young to the old, mm -hmm. that uh, the discrimination of human faces more, which is like non-conspecific. So do you think that there is also a switch of the processing or of the correlated response of those traits? Because these are fundamentally very different when it's non-specific, non-conspecific. Right, you mean the other than those inner parts? Yeah, like say for example, if we are looking at humans and mm -hmm. we are looking at uh, not only eyes, but we are looking at nose, we are looking at mm -hmm. chin, other places, and we have a better like discrimination of the geographical region from which the population is, the individual is drawn. So, is it the similar case that we grow when you go grow older? I mean juveniles become adult, mm -hmm. they have like a higher, uh, you know, uh, uh, processing, I don't know what it is, but uh, of discriminating between those correlated response of how you process those correlated response. Um, I am not fully get the point yet, but the, um, okay, I will try to make it clear. So you said the, during they grow up, then they more tune up to use those correlated Processing or yeah, so is there this switch from young to the old right in discriminating humans? Mm -hmm. Is it because you are processing a broader range of variables which are correlated at the first place, which you don't find in non specifics, perhaps? Hmm, still, I'm not sure. So, so they are exposed to more. Are the okay, just I do it a different way. So, what I think is the case for here is they pretty much similar um, captive environment. But what we found is the, given that in captivity they are exposed to only limited number of the conspecifics, okay? 
So they are tuning their visual system toward processing their own species first. And later on, they are exposed to more and more human again and again over the years. Then they have to refine their visual template, face template toward their new face category, the human faces. And the, of course, there is some possibility they may use another facial feature like a hair or the counter. But in that case, probably they will not employ the visual other kind of similar right hemisphere, which can more specific to the expertise and also configure processing. So which kind of clue that they use different the same face processing, but it can be refined toward the human faces later on based on the, their long exposure toward the human. Does it make sense? One last question, please. Uh, good afternoon. I uh, especially want the first ones where you inverted the image mm -hmm. and we were not able to distinguish exactly the similarity between the two faces. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, that could be because, well, uh, yeah, as you said, we are tuned to seeing faces that are erect. So when you invert the image, it is perhaps perceptually not as important for us to remember inverted faces as it is for us to remember faces that are. Maybe, because that is important for us to remember faces that are erect. And uh, on, the, on the other way, uh, like when you inverted the eyes, that Thatcher illusion, and which took more time, did you do it the other way around also? Because, for example, I would not want to watch that same kind of face, that inverted face, for a long duration hmm. uh, for, of time. Because, well, it sort of looks hideous. Right. So when you invert it and it looks kind of straight, so that same kind of thing must be happening even for the animal, that uh, which is mm -hmm. why it would want to look at it longer. The first of all, I mean, that's a really good point. And that's actually how we developed this kind of the face partial system. Because we are exposed to the upright faces for the whole life, it's not important to process in the inverted faces. Then what happened is, of course, keeping the configurable information or keeping flexibility to process those information is really cost, take a cost in the processing. That's why we kind of cut off those parts. So then we just keep configure processing for the upright faces but we just give up to doing the same thing for the inverted faces. That's actually how we actually develop and maybe how it's evolved as well. And for the inverted face, you can see from here, like in the beginning, they see the almost same level as the upright faces, which means the interest toward the picture itself is not so much different. Either upright or inverted, they look at this picture and then they got bored in the same way. So that is not the uh, case for the, at least for here. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.